Welcome to the second instalment of What If Star Wars Was On Earth. Thank you to all of you who left their contributions in the comments. If you want an episode 3, make sure to get this channel to 30,000 subscribers. Enjoy the story. In the greenhouse, otherwise known as the Room of a Thousand Fountains, the Jedi Master Obi-Wan Kenobi sat on the floor in a state of meditation. With the Clone War advancing, Obi-Wan had started to see terrible visions of an attack on Coruscant. Unfortunately for the galaxy, Padme gets killed in the attack, Anakin falls to the dark side, and he even murdered a lot of younglings in a frenzy. Obi-Wan's ruminations were disturbed by Grandmaster Yoda, who could sense great fear from the Jedi Master, until they both felt a seismic shockwave in the Force. Both Jedi fell back onto the floor, as all of the Jedi screamed around them, until they were brought to their senses by Yoda, who used a Jedi channel in his comlink, and ordered everyone to gather in the main courtyard. The Grand Master is joined by a number of clone commanders, who gave details that confirmed their feelings in the Force, and Coruscant was about to be destroyed by an unknown entity. The chants outside of their sanctuary echoed that Coruscant would never give in or surrender, and as the Jedi Council meditated, they felt that Earth was an undiscovered nexus that could save them. Nothing was left to chance by the Council, and with just a few Jedi Knights and Masters, each leading a battalion of clones guarding Coruscant, Everyone else including the Senators mobilised in the nearest landing platform. An entire fleet of Republic destroyers, cruisers and lighter aircraft were flown in from missions on other worlds, where the Sith had obviously felt the same shockwave as the Jedi, and abandoned their battles. Already on their way to Earth, Dooku and the Sith were as usual, one step ahead of the Jedi. With his master Sidious with the Jedi, Count Dooku looked at the accounts on the history of this strange yet somehow familiar world, as he considered the similarities to his own galaxy, from a confederacy of independent states which tried to secede from what they viewed as a corrupt and tyrannical republic, to a constitutional monarchy, devoted to secede from an increasingly overarching federation of countries, and most interestingly, a small but current worldwide monarchist movement, which wished to free all nations from globalist republican tyranny, and instead have an aristocratic Democratic head of state much like himself. The Sith was broken from his reverie by the voice of his FA-4 pilot droid, who informed him that there were two incoming vehicles, one of whom belonged to Grievous, and the other was unknown. Dooku's eyes narrowed as he ordered the trailing Admiral Trench to focus their attack on the unidentified target. The craft in fact belonged to the former Zabrak Sith Maul, and having sensed this was his moment, his grand plan was continuing as he had foreseen, as he turned on the cloaking device in his scimitar to land in a suitable area to watch the carnage unfold. The first Venator-class Star Destroyer that drifted through him was headed by Obi-Wan Kenobi, Anakin Skywalker and Ahsoka Tano, who had been given the vital role of gathering information from all of North, Central and South America. As they begun their descent, the Jedi lead their destroyer to Admiral Yularen, as they led the clones out in their starfighters, and set course for the rocky mountain range. The Jedi forces landed in Colorado's Telluride Regional Airport, which looked silent excluding commercial flights, and they used their macro binoculars to view the mountains, when Anakin sees a familiar Naboo star skiff floating down from the clouds. The Jedi rush to the mountain aboard a gunship, where Anakin reunites with Senator Amidala, as they take a walk around the terrain, which consisted of glaciers and sedimentary rock, Anakin and Padme met a lost tribe of Wookiees in the first layer of forests. Led by Chewbacca and General Tarful, the Wookiees had already constructed rudimentary shelter for their grove, allowing the Jedi to establish their mobile command centre. Whilst most of the Jedi were yet to arrive or missing, Yoda had been busy investigating the mysterious world, finding lemons to be disgusting fruit, and found the people of this planet to be very interesting, as he had already been offered ketamine and to adopt a baby within an hour of landing. More significantly for their survival, he had found numerous recordings and images of those on Earth, showing their own order, so Anakin Ahsoka and Obi-Wan decided to watch Revenge of the Sith for answers. The Jedi were mindful that this was merely fictional, but they were left shaken and felt this was an ominous warning, so they decided to try and look for the actors, and divided the Jedi into cities across the world. Obi-Wan, Anakin and Ahsoka decided to fly to the Anaheim Convention Center, where they heard a gathering was occurring, and they take their starfighters to California. The fleet of Jedi aircraft was not unnoticed by the local military air forces, but using mind tricks from a distance, they managed to traverse any aerial defences which the state had launched from their bases. 
At the Grand Plaza, a large crowd were already waiting to enter the five halls in the arena when the Jedi and the clones made their entrance, and the crowd thought this was the first act of the show. The sound of smoke and confetti behind them made them turn their heads to all of the actors and staff of the franchise, and Obi-Wan led the guests to meet George Lucas, using his customary greeting. Anakin would soon find Ewan McGregor, and ushered his master to meet him, and Obi-Wan and Ewan would both say hello there at the same time, as the fans broke out into cheers of excitement. The show would get even better, as the distinct starfighter of General Mace Windu glided to a halt beside the main building, and Master Windu turned to look into the eyes of a bald, dark-skinned man, with a face so familiar who looks at him, and they asked each other who they were looking at. Behind them, Ahsoka sees a little girl looking at her and smiles, and the little girl's face lights up until they hear the sound of Anakin sneezing. Everyone turned to the Jedi Knight in horror before running back into the main halls, with the area manager threatening the whole Jedi Order for them to be shut down for two weeks because of COVID-19 if they didn't leave the ground as soon as they could. C-3PO moves to the side of the confused Jedi and reveals the difficulties that the world of Earth had been enduring, with the war beginning across the Atlantic Ocean. The Jedi begun to debate whether or not they should aid the efforts in Europe when they receive a transmission from the United Kingdom and that the Chancellor had made a safe landing. The reality was, the Chancellor was fascinated by the vast territory the country once had and was taking notes from libraries and museums for his own schemes, but as he looked at the military might on offer, he smirked with discontent at the state of the world that he was on and wondered if he could try to use the war on Earth to his advantage. The Sith Lord asked the Royal Guard to distract any arriving clones, as he entered into a Sith Starfighter and searched for either Grievous or Dooku. The towering figure of Grievous bowed to the Sith Lord, as the cyborg had been roughly released in the midst of the war in France. As Grievous walked through the wreckage, he thought of his own homeworld of Kali, and decided to abandon the Separatists to help fight for Earth, but he would not tell Sidious, as he listened to the Sith Lord, ordering for him to take over the entire territory with his droid army. Grievous bowed to the fading hologram, but he had no intention of following these orders, and he took the fight to the east, before they could obtain kyber crystals and technology, and start growing its influence. Unfortunately for Grievous, clone intelligence had landed shortly after the droid general, and had seen the Jedi killer examining the wreckage that had been caused, and relayed this to all the other Jedi. In Anaheim, the Jedi had already left the convention center after their misdemeanor, and Anakin had already been flying around the state, going to visit a zoo, then becoming viral on YouTube through his control of the animals. Anakin was diverted to Mexico, where he tried to solve the mystery of the Mayans, joined by his master, whilst the other Jedi went to save Europe, other than Ahsoka who had been sent to Mars. Anakin and Obi-Wan were travelling to Mexico, followed by Anakin's new army of fans, when they sensed a disturbance in the Force. This is confirmed by the console in front of them, flashing a global news item, revealing the Master Sakura had just been the target of the United Nations. The two Jedi realise that the Mayans have been allured by the unknown enemy, and turn back, but as they glide over Florida, they are struck by an attack from above. Whilst this attack would have killed most Jedi, Anakin and Obi-Wan used the force to balance each other's starfighters in the air, and fell down onto the ground with their astromechs. Their starfighters were destroyed, and observing their surroundings, R2-D2 uncovered they had landed on a golf course. Feeling the breeze of the sea nearby, the Jedi walked towards it, when they are attacked again from above, and Obi-Wan shoved Anakin into a bunker for cover. The giant collection of sand covered the Jedi Knight, and Anakin found himself buried and covered in sand, as the barrage ended, allowing him to be finally rescued, but he was severely mentally scarred by the ordeal. With no time to waste, the Jedi look for a vehicle to get them across the Atlantic Ocean, when they see NASA's launch center in the retired shuttle Atlantis. Obi-Wan wants to try and discreetly escort the visitors, but Anakin uses the Force to lift the shuttle from its stanchion, tearing a hole in the ceiling, before taking control whilst the shuttle rested tenuously on the roof of the center, now at a vertical angle. Obi-Wan grudgingly joined Anakin in the forward fuselage, as R2-D2 closed the cargo bay doors and initiated a launch sequence, as the visitors and staff looked in disbelief and amazement. Even Earth's most intricate vehicle could not confuse Anakin, who flew the shuttle with the skill of an astronaut and left the Earth's atmosphere. Anakin could sense Ahsoka moving closer to the location, and after several orbits of Earth, he saw her in her starfighter, being chased by a cloaked figure in a futuristic looking aircraft, and a large fleet. Anakin dives towards the ground, and with their breathing masks, the Jedi use their rocket boosters on their astromechs, and fly to the western front. 
The battle is one of massive confusion, as the Jedi are fighting Earth's forces, and the droid forces of Grievous. When the dread that they had felt from Coruscant drifted above them, and cast a shadow that sent shivers down the back of the warriors. From the starfighter at the front of the formation, the Gungan Jar Jar Binks walked down to the floor with menace, but unlike the foolish ambassador in the Senate, this Jar Jar looked cold and calculated as he raised one of his hands from his ornate robes, and an army of Gungans emerged from their vehicles, including the former Jedi Kosa Yin Hadu. The Sith cult ignited their blades, as Jar Jar discreetly loosened his coat to reveal his lightsaber, and then ordered for his force to fire. The whistles from the dark sky told everyone that artillery would be landing, and Anakin ordered the Jedi to run for the fighters. The Jedi flew onto the Arc-170 starfighters of the clones, as they retreated to reassess this latest threat, and how to free Ahsoka still being held by the Gungans. Anakin's frustration had reached its limit, as the Jedi moved out of the command base, and let out a roar that he had read about. In a store near the convention center on Anaheim, and the ground below the vantage point began to shake, as the Gungan landing craft started to break from the strength of the wave. This first lethal wave would become the beginning of the end for Earth, as the galaxy's clone wars had made its final destination, and from the Ewoks to Yuuzhan Vong, everyone began to rain destruction. At the centre of the chaos, Rex had silently been admiring the array of armaments that the world had to show, until we heard from his general that Jar Jar just called for a secret batch of nuclear warheads. Having freed Ahsoka, the two Jedi found Obi-Wan, and they ascended through the smoke and missile fire created by the Death Watch to travel to the world ship, which Jar Jar had taken from the Yuuzhan Vong. When the Jedi navigated the swinging arms of the exterior, the inside resembled that of a more conventional Star Destroyer, and they can sense the darkness of the Sith in the Force. With the guidance of R2-D2, the Jedi follow the unique schematics, when they see Dooku, Grievous and Sidious at the bridge. When Sidious removed his hood to reveal the Supreme Chancellor, Anakin looked in shock at the betrayal, but the Sith Lord directed one of his gnarly fingers to a corner, where Jar Jar emerged. The Sith are unsure of who to attack, but Jar Jar soon faded in an instant, leaving Sidious and Dooku to attack Anakin and Ahsoka, and Obi-Wan to duel his old foe Grievous. The Jedi looked to be at a severe disadvantage, but from their turbo lift, Ewan McGregor, Samuel L. Jackson and Ian McDiarmid had thrown from Anaheim to save the world, and the Sith are confused, believing them to be clones of those they were fighting. The Jedi used a distraction to kill Dooku and Sidious, leaving Grievous to be stunned by the arriving clone battalion, as Jar Jar returned, and told them they would witness the true power of the Force. Jar Jar began to glow like an ethereal god of Mortis, and unleashed a torrent of elements to ravage their surroundings, and blew a hole in the Yorick coral, as the Jedi struggled to reach their breathing masks. Their acting equivalents collected them in their borrowed vehicles, but Anakin had other ideas, as he ran to the munitions bay, and turned the launchers onto the ship's bridge, and initiated the firing sequence for the nuclear missiles. As Anakin dived from the detonating ship to a flying droid, the demonic screams of Jar Jar could be felt in the Force, and the war that had decimated billions had ended. When the Jedi landed, Earth's armies were clearing the mess left behind, and hearing the sound of sirens, the Jedi thought it was best if they ran away. That is it for the second edition of What If Star Wars Was On Earth, if you'd like to see another instalment for this what if, please like this video, turn on your notification bell, and help the channel reach 30,000 subscribers. And as always, leave a comment on what what if you'd all like to see next, and how I can improve my videos. Thank you very much for watching, and see you next time.